What's up, everybody, and welcome to this week's episode of the Well Man's Podcast. My name is Brian Brosey. I'm here with my friend, Keone Tita. Keone, how are you today? Good. How are you, Brian? Great. And hopefully everybody else out there is okay. And hopefully um, everybody is doing their, their, I don't know, I guess I would say duty as far as keeping everybody safe. So our talk today is on, you know, are masks appropriate, especially considering the current um, pandemic that we're going through with um, COVID-19 and the coronavirus. Yeah, so, so are we talking if masks are appropriate right now, Keone, or are we talking about when they are appropriate as well? I, well, we're going to hit on, I, we're going to hit on all of that, like when they're appropriate and when they're not appropriate. So hopefully we'll cover a lot of that. Awesome. Um, anyway, and then we'll try to, I'll try to review, we'll try to review after we go through it. But, but let's just keep in mind that masks are just one part of a four part um, kind of strategy to keep ourselves and others safe from being infected from the virus. So one of them is, you know, if, if you can stay at home and if you can't stay away from crowds, that, that, that's really huge. And if you're going into crowds, wear a mask, wash your hands. That's a big one. Social distance. They say about two meters or six feet away. And that's based on some studies they've done on droplets, which we'll talk about, you know, in a while. And, um, you know, wear masks and when you wear them, wear them appropriate. So let's go over, cause I know there's a lot of controversy on those and, I think you and I, Brian, correct me if I'm wrong, but we kind of fall on the, the pro mask side of things um, based on our, uh, you know, our profession right? And, and what we know so far. But I want to, I just want to go just say a couple things about why me and you are pro mask. And I just want to start with a very basic thing. You know, Brian, Brian and I do this podcast weekly. Um, we both have a job in healthcare and we also have, you know, are probably going to be more exposed than other people, especially mm -hmm. Brian with what he does. But with that being said, Brian and I have done a little bit of research, including the research that we've done for this podcast. Um, and we probably read a bunch of stuff, maybe some studies here and there, maybe read some stuff on social media, pro and con. We always try to do that. But I would say for us, what we're what we really should rely on as healthcare providers is who's doing the real studies where's the money going and who should we trust so throughout the world there have been numerous studies and recommendations done on mask wearing versus non-mask wearing and these this is done by scientists all over the world with various different countries based on their their governmental health organizations and um, we're talking about billions of dollars spent to give public recommendations for that brian and i two brains in this whole scene can't even come close to perusing all the data that's out there yeah. so as as healthcare providers we know our limitations we we, we are not connected to all that data, nor do we have the time to go through that. So we probably felt we're going to focus or at least give precedence to the, to like the CDC or the world health organization to see what they, they have to say, and then we'll go from there. But really that's, that's where I'm going to go. Like based on nothing else, I'm going to listen to what they have to say. It doesn't mean I'm just going to be, you know, not question it or anything like that. Um, because science is like a moving target, you know, it always self-corrects. It is constantly changing. We don't know much about this virus. Um, we don't know everything there is to know about masks either. But based on the recommendations that we know now, they are recommending masks, especially when we're in crowds. Yep. So that's kind of my fallback. But let's go into why they're recommending that and some of the studies out there on that. Um, but before we go, I just want to say mask wearing is nothing new. So just some brief history on this. Um, you know, in the, in the Middle Ages, they, they had what's called plague doctors, and they used to mask up because they used to think that, you know, bad odors caused uh, disease. That's a really good common sense thing to think. I mean, you know, from an evolutionary perspective, we as humans, when we're confronted with a bad odor, 
that's, that's very high in anaerobic bacteria or disease uh, bacteria, causing bacteria, we know to stay away from that. Um, that's why, you know, we, we don't hang out during at sewer systems or anything like that, or try to, you know, we don't swim in unclean water and stuff like that. Um, but probably the first studies that were done was, was by a woman named Dr. Alice Hamilton is 1905. And she did some of the first studies on masks. And this was like, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it was mass for getting rid of particulate matter, but also she also mattered, uh, measured like strep bacteria coming out of the coughs of surgeons and doctors and things like that. So she was one of the first to recommend mass during surgery. And then during 1910, there's a guy named Dr. Wu Ling Ta, who, who basically during a pneumonic plague in Manchuria, he was appointed by the Chinese government to figure out how to stop the spread. And based on what he, he argued was wearing masks can help. This was before the 1918 um, Spanish flu, where now it became a good recommendation that even back then that people, people should, should wear masks. So, so I'm, I'm just bringing that up. So we, we have known for a long time that masks, um, masks at, at worst, don't don't cause disease, right? right. Or I mean, I should say at best, don't cause disease, um, and and may help. So with with just that, we may know that. But also, it reminds me of something in history by um, the the hand washing guy. He's a 19th century Hungarian doctor. That's why I remember him. His name is Ignaz Semmelweis, who who was a doctor in 1847 who came up with this idea that, hey, you know, why are women dying during childbirth? Maybe we should wash our hands. And he was ridiculed, you know, during that time for, for even recommending that. And it kind of reminds me that we're kind of repeating history with this. Yeah. It's just kind of common sense stuff. And washing hands now is like, nobody's going to deny that. Right. Speaking of the virus, the reason why washing hands works for bacteria and viral particles is, you know, the cell wall um, of bacteria, but also vir virus particles are made of, of fatty substances. So anytime you put soap and fat together, it destroys that. That's why you're going to destroy those things. So hand washing is a big, big, big component. So if you're doing that alone, you're helping. Yeah. But just makes me think like, you know, this is, I think in another 200 years, they're going to be like, yeah, that was just common sense. You know, people should be, should be wearing, wearing masks. Yeah, it's pretty funny. Me and my Haley, my girlfriend, were just talking about it before we hopped on the podcast, how I can't imagine, you know, working at this skilled nursing facility that I'm at right now when they didn't wear masks with every patient at all times. Right. And, and so I think like you're saying, now it's becoming, I can't imagine the time when we weren't like that. It's like this hand washing thing, like you're mentioning. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Um, but let's let's just go over some of the the myths with this and some of the facts. So so one one of the the myths that I think was out there is that people were saying that well you know we don't need to wear a mask because you know just stay out of old folks' homes or facilities that are treating old people yada yada yada. So therefore you know you're good. Don't wear a mask. We know that's not true. Um, every, anybody can get infected by this any age, um, and we're we're finding out that out more and more. So the same goes for um, the whole myth that young people can't get it. That's not true. They also can't. They can get it. Although it seems like younger people may be more likely to uh, to carry or spread it or and and be spreaders of it. Um, basically, that may have something to do with the strong immune system that they have compared compared to others. Another myth is that um, hot temperatures uh, kill the virus. And that's not true either. If, if that was really true, we would see that things in like the um, equatorial areas of the world would have very, very low, low counts of it. And right now in the United States, here in the Southeast, we are in full summer and we're getting temperatures well above the uh, 80 degrees Fahrenheit that they say kills the virus. But with that being said, hot temperatures do have UV light, so UV light can help kill the virus. But we also have to think the virus is not floating around usually by itself in the air. It's right, it's in you. <laughs> <laughs> True, sure but it's also, it, if, it does, if it does get out, usually from us, it's usually in droplets, okay? okay. And usually those droplets um, fall to the ground 
um, and get and stay on the ground when they are. So that's one of the reasons why you want to like distance yourself, right? So that's where they talk about the six feet distancing apart. Yeah. Um, also, wearing a mask, um, depending on the the weave, it is absolutely true. Um, a virus is very very tiny, so the 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 argument out there that the virus can go through masks, that's absolutely true. It certainly can, but yep. the virus is enveloped or within droplets. And so droplets have a harder time and are much bigger than a virus to get through the, get through a mask. Yep. So, so when you hear the argument, well, masks don't work because the virus can get through there. You know, you have to take that in context. The virus is very small. So that is true, but viruses don't travel um, by themselves, they're usually in respiratory droplets. Right. So, um, as far as in your research, Keone, have you encountered anything that says that talks about the length of time that it'll live on a surface? Because I know that was a hotly debated point. Um, I I think um, based on what they're finding now, um, viruses can live on the depending on the materials and depending if they're they're kind of protected by the respiratory droplet or whatever, or not exposed to UV light. It can be from anywhere from a half hour to, to a few hours, but being on surfaces is not the, uh, you know, is not as big as a problem as they once thought right. where they are saying about wiping everything down. Really. Yeah. If you go back to those strategies we talked about at the beginning, you're, you're doing great. It's still a good, good um, protocol to wipe things down and to disinfect things and, and clean things. But um, they're certainly not living on the surface as long as they were saying for days on end. That's for sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, you know, one of the things that people say, well, mat masks are, are um, you know, can create uh, low oxygen levels in the blood. And that's not true. That's, that's been studied over and over again. I mean, if you have a, a a pulse oximeter to test your do you guys have that at work ryan where you can test your oxygen level mm -hmm. clip on i mean yeah absolutely basically you can basically they've done done studies um where you can put on like five six seven masks over you over your face and for the most part they are not causing low oxygen levels or for that matter high co2 levels um and you this has been tested so that that is not an issue. One of the things is masks are not comfortable. That is true. I'll be the first to admit that. Um, anytime you have a barrier in front of your, your face, it feels like breathing may be more difficult because of that mechanical barrier, because it's inhibiting airflow. But that does not mean, again, the masks are, are uh, they're not going to stop, they're, they're not going to stop molecules of oxygen or CO2 from leaving going out and in of the mass, but it will stop respiratory droplets. And that's been tested. So that's not, that's really not an issue. Um, and in fact, um, high CO2 levels, um, you know, are, are not an issue because they, they come out also, but also um, you can't get uh, too much CO2 in the blood, which is called hypercapnia. hypercapnia. Um, not, not likely to happen at all, um, if masks are used appropriately. So let's just talk about masks being used appropriately. One of the things are, is how about the circumstance of where you're wearing the mask? So an appropriate use of the mask, if you're a frontline worker, and I would say, Brian, you're more of a frontline worker than I am, because you, I think you're seeing, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Very acute. People, yeah, very acute. People that may be more, you know, have a lot of other uh, comorbidities and things like that going on. Um, so you're probably getting more exposure in your workplace. It would probably be best to, if you have it to wear an N95, um, if you were actually in an ICU unit or a COVID unit, maybe an N95 with a surgical mask. I think they've done both with a face visor, um, that type of thing. But, uh, for me, I generally see relatively healthy, healthy people. And for the rest of us, if we're going into, um, you know, stores and things, other masks like a, uh, a surgical mask or cloth, cloth mask um, definitely do help stop the droplets from getting through. Not only do they help stop the droplets from getting through, but these droplets have less momentum when they do get through. So guess what? 
maybe uh, less momentum means that they're not going to fly out of your mouth through the mask and, and be able to go six feet and, and hit somebody else. Usually they're going to drop very quickly if they do because they don't have the momentum because they're trying to get through that barrier. Um, but anyway, it's an appropriate use of the mask. So when and where, what type of mask to use. But for the general public, because this is a big deal, but for the general public, um, a cloth mask does help. A cloth mask going into an ICU unit um, is not appropriate. So I just, I just want to say that there. And there was some confusion in the beginning because initially, um, I think it was Dr. Fauci was saying things like, or, or the, the CDC was saying, you know, at the very beginning of this pandemic, you don't need a mask, da, 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 da. And one of the reasons they were saying that was because that they want, we were, had a low supply of masks, or at least what they say, had a low supply, and they wanted to save the N95s for frontline workers. Okay. I think that they misled the public with that and confused us a lot with that. Um, they should have just been straight up honest with us why they were saying that, or at least been more clear about that. Um, yeah. Because I think that created more problems than it, than it helped, and it created a, a distrust. Yeah, absolutely. With that. Um, what, well, oh, the, one of the, <laughs> one of the, one of the other, uh, myths are if you're wearing a mask, you don't breathe out toxic junk. You don't, you're not able to detox. Um, number of things, first of all, uh, you don't really detox through your breath. And for that matter, you don't really detox through your sweat. Um, you detox through your organs of elimination primarily. So we're talking about your liver, your kidneys, um, so that's really where you want to focus your detox. And we talk about that on, on our detox, some of our podcasts before, like where you really want to try to detox. So you're not detoxing by, by uh, or creating more toxins by wearing, wearing a mask. Um, you know, another reason is for this whole, this whole thing with masks are, you know, nobody is saying that masks are 100% effective. In fact, no medical intervention is 100% effective. But we are decreasing our risk and, and exposure. And yeah. in, in conjunction with hand washing, distancing, avoiding crowds, it's really, really huge and can help a lot. Um, I've seen stuff floating around the internet on mask ex exemption cards. Um, that is fake news. There's no, that, whatever whatever you see these cards out there well i have my mask exemption card um those are not true um whoever is making them is 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 it's problematic that's so, funny i haven't heard of that kenny <laughs> oh you haven't no. well you see you see them on the internet some of these uh, you know mask exemption cards that are handed out supposedly by i think some government agency that seems to have credentials or whatever that's hilarious um, <laughs> right and then there are other, there are, you know, there are other people that will say, well, I, sh I can't wear a mask because I have asthma or COPD and da, 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 mm -hmm. da, um, that type of thing. Well, we just talked about that uh, it doesn't really affect, it doesn't affect oxygen levels. It doesn't make you have too much CO2 in your, in your blood. However, with that being said, if you are one of those people where a mask creates um, issues, just stress for you then you should really take it upon yourself to really go overboard with the other preventives, washing your hands, avoid crowds, stay home when possible. Don't go into areas where, where there are um, known exposures and things like that. And talk to, your, talk to your doctor about it. Another thing about COVID is um, the infection rates are, are low and that, that's considering they're low. Um, but that's an argument that I think can be used against people. They say, well, why should we worry about it? Because the, the infection, infection rate and death rate is low. First of all, the infection rate is pretty high on this. The death rate is pretty low when compared to other viruses. But I think the death rate is like one in 200 people. And if we said in the United States, like what would that do with a population of 300 million people or more? You're talking about 1.5 million deaths across the U United States. Um, with a death rate that is one in 200. So that's an issue. And right now, um, we're not even close to that. Not even close to that. Not to mention, 
that if you do get infected, now we're seeing all these sequelae like heart damage, we're seeing um, permanent lung scarring, uh, an increase in strokes, um, some cognitive impairment. There's all kinds of lingering effects of this virus that we don't know much about and don't know why it's happening. So it's not just about getting it, being asymptomatic, getting over it. I mean, a lot of people are having tons of issues that are gonna have ton, you know, really big health effects cost-wise, cost um, not only for the person, but um, healthcare costs for a long, long time. Right. So that's something that we really, really need to, to think about. Right. Um, you know, the other thing is uh, feeling healthy and normal, thinking that you don't have it. That is not, uh, <laughs> that, that doesn't, that's not diagnosable that you don't. Okay. So just going back to the, a lot of people are asymptomatic. And then also with testing, there's a testing backlog. So you may get tested on Monday and then you may not get your results till the following Monday and oops, they found that you're positive and then you've been going around without a mask for a week, you know, walking around the public and thinking that you're okay because you don't have any symptoms, but yet possibly exposing, exposing people. Yeah, absolutely. I would say at this point and where we're at, there's no excuse not to, not to wear the mask. You know, not feeling bad is definitely not an excuse for, oh, I don't need a mask. Right, right. As you mentioned, it's your duty at this point where we're at. It is, and it's, a, it's an inconvenience. I don't like wearing them. I, I hate wearing them because they, they feel hot. They, you know, they make my breathing feel constricted. Um, this your is breath especially... tastes like asshole. I don't know about you, but after, <laughs> yeah. after six or seven yeah. hours of yeah. wearing a mask for me, I'm yeah. like, holy yeah. hell. Yeah, and, and you, you get humid in there, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, oh, it's yeah. humid. But, but you know what's really interesting about that, Brian? That humidity you feel from wearing the mask mm -hmm. actually helps you not spread. And what I mean by that, you create, or you create more droplets in there because of that wet environment around your mouth. So therefore, that wetness can't get out as much. Mm -hmm. so, so, so that humidity feeling or that humid feeling is... is uh, is something that you know is helpful for not spreading it um a few things about studies and i'm not going to go and like name off studies but i've seen a, things floating around the internet i've seen some local health clinics believe it or not who put out stuff that say masks don't work based on our research a couple things i want to say about that most of the studies that say masks are ineffective um are not gold standard studies double blind placebo controlled studies okay we don't have we don't have those say that and the ones that we do have say that masks work okay um the other thing is is a lot of these studies were drawing conclusions that really aren't the dr correct conclusions from these studies i'll give an example of some of the studies so masks like a surgical mask or a mask not fitted right can create jetties or or explosive uh, momentum coming out the sides of the mask or up the mask or anything like that if they're not fitted right or put on right. Um, this is especially true if you wear a mask where you just basically cover your mouth and not your nose. But anyway, a mask should be fitted right or you should know how to, how to use them appropriately. Because um, a lot of masks will say, oh, you know, well, we've, we've looked at this and you're getting just as much exposure. Well, if they're not fitted right, you know, that may be a problem with the, the study. So a lot of these studies have a lot of other confounding fat, um, uh, problems with them. But I'll just leave it, leave it at that. Right now, the preponderance of the evidence seems to say that uh, masks work. And I go back to um, know thy limitations with me and you, right? Me and you are not epi you know, we, we, we don't study this stuff. We're not researchers. 100%. So, so right. So we have to fall, we kind of have to fall back on that. Um, uh, they've done simple studies where, you know, um, there's this one doctor I saw online who would wear, wear a mask and he had all these Petri dishes lined up and, um, he did that versus not wearing a mask, coughing and stuff. And then on these Petri dishes without wearing a mask, you see all this growth on the Petri dishes. When he wore a mask, you see very little growth. So basically what that's showing is, again, the, in Petri dishes, we're talking about bacteria, but the same concept applies. Um, you know, wearing a mask helps. 
So it basically it demonstrates the blocking effects of that, which is really just, just common sense. Um, right. Yeah, I would agree. <laughs> it's fascinating to me too, the whole mask wearing controversy, because it makes me think of things uh, in history that were kind of like not only the hand washing with um, Ignaz Semmelweis, but also like with using umbrellas like parasols. You know, it used to just be considered a female accessory until some smart man decided, well, you know, why not? I, why don't I use that? It was pro probably a woman who, decided, <laughs> who, who said this. Why don't I use that to stop the rain because I don't want to get wet and, care, and didn't really care about the macho-ness of not wearing, using the umbrella, so to speak. That's funny. I haven't heard it, of that. It, <laughs> and it's actually in, in there's a while back in, in Texas when we, they were trying to clean up litter they were trying to think of a campaign to help clean up litter and they would just put on the road signs you know pick up your trash well they that actually created didn't do anything to help and may have made the littering worse and it was basically like screw you i'm not picking up trash and i'm going to throw it out you know da, 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 da. and basically what they did to change the the media or the uh, marketing of it is they put dallas cowboys up there players famous players that would pick up trash and all of a sudden the trash got picked up now it's considered macho to pick up the trash <laughs> maybe the same could be said for condom use too um anyway it's it's a way master a way to protect yourself and to protect others yeah absolutely um, what else do i want to kind of talk oh. about precautions keone kind of educate yeah. people a little bit on precautions and what they mean. So this is directly from the CDC. So standard precautions are used for all patient care. They're based on risk assessment and make use of common sense practice and personal protective equipment use that protect healthcare providers from infection and prevent the spread of infection from patient to patient. So then that's applicable to our grocery store right now, that patient to patient interaction essentially at the grocery right. And that's standard precaution, the ones that we use for all patient care, where we uh, can shout out Ignis, because the first thing is hand washing. This is real general hand washing, use of PPE when possible exposure um, is expected. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. Um, and then following like respiratory and hygiene, cough, etiquette and protocols, you know, coughing into your shoulder or your elbow, that sort of thing. Right. Um, but then going deeper into transmission based precautions. So this is both for healthcare providers, but usable for everyone right now as we're going through this transmission based precautions are the second tier of basic infection control and are to be used in addition to standard precautions for patients who may be infected or colonized with certain infectious agents for which additional precautions are needed to prevent infection transmission. So then this allows me to highlight kind of that one of the key thing about the mask is essentially the mask is so you're not spreading it. It's not necessarily that you're not getting it as much as you're not spreading your germs out there to everyone else. Right, right. And then within these transmission based precautions, they break down into contact precautions, droplet precautions, and airborne precautions. And this is where at the beginning of I guess in March or whatever, we saw a little bit of confusion because like you were mentioning with the ma mask, Keone, at first we thought, you know, it's airborne precaution or it's, it's droplet and we weren't quite sure. And that's where the N95 is the only one for the airborne precautions that we see that's super actually more effective than like the cloth mask. But then right. we fall back on the research that we just mentioned and common sense knowledge of a barrier is a barrier and it's probably a good thing even if it right. doesn't hold up against the entire storm. Just to I'll say one thing about the N95 mask, or some of those masks that you see at store, the ones that are vented are probably not great. Even. Right. So I just want to say that. So Because I see a lot of people wearing vented masks, and those aren't the most appropriate according to what I'm seeing. Yeah, and as far as I know, and I'm no expert on this, but an N95 mask never has vents. <laughs> like these are the ones that are really fitted. They're, they're like greenish blue yeah. kind of teal. Um, yeah. And they those are really fitted speaking on the fit. But so the, the breakdown of those transmission based precautions, like I said, contact precautions, droplet precautions and airborne precautions, basically as a healthcare worker, you're going to be aware of these based on what the disease is that you may be encountering. And I think with coronavirus where I, I know that it's was initially talked about air being airborne precautions. But I think we're, we're playing it really safe. And from what I can see in my experience in the hospital and the skilled nursing facility 
is we're playing it super safe. So we're kind of combining all of these into airborne droplet and we're wearing gowns and masks and all that kind of stuff when we're dealing with yep. these. I know in the hospital, they're wearing like hair nets. When I worked with mm -hmm. um, a COVID patient before, you know, I've got glasses on, that sort of stuff. So I'm just going to break these down real quick, a little individually. So contact precautions are really just where we wear a gown and gloves. And so here you're, you're limiting that physical contact. So that kind of tells you about what we would be concerned about how the transmission would go down that physical contact. So then you're, you're wearing the gown and the gloves for contact precautions. And then with all of these precautions, you're really, obviously you're taking care to be extra sanitary in the area. The patient really isn't leaving the room or if they are leaving the room, they're under a specific type of transport protocol. And then right. with droplet precautions, so droplet precautions are for patients known or suspected to be infected with pathogens transmitted by respiratory droplets that are generated by a patient who is coughing, sneezing, or talking. So the source control is put a mask on the patient because that makes sense. Droplet precautions, these are things coming out of someone's front orifices that could infect us. So putting a mask on the patient would be step one. And then we're donning a mask ourselves, so we're not breathing in. And then following all that other standard protocol of hand washing the gloves, that sort of thing. But at this point, we don't have a, uh, a gown on as far as I know. And then airborne precautions, again, this is for patients known or suspected to be infected with pathogens transmitted by the airborne route, like tuberculosis, measles, chicken pox, um, and the, those types of things. Again, we're going to put a mask on the patient. That's our source control. We're stopping it kind of at the source. It's the person who's infected who could really spread that out. Um, and then we want to, these people are typically on like a negative air pressure room. So when you open the door, the air flows into the patient's room. So you don't have any of those droplets flo floating out into oh, the hospital airway or yeah. anything yep. like that. Um, and then here's where you're really wearing an N95. Um, like that's the standard mask for these type of precautions. And of course you're limiting the transport and all those other precautions that I just mentioned before go on top. So you may be wearing gown, mask, gloves, eyewear, um, all that sort of stuff. So that helps at least just kind of break down some of the lingo that you're hearing in the news, um, yeah. kind of when it's appropriate and how a healthcare provider is kind of going about thinking about those. But I think the most important thing to get across is, and we're in a different time now where, like we've mentioned, it's your duty to wear the mask. And even if you don't feel any symptoms, everything that we know and the way this is flaring up, we definitely have to take extra precaution and be, be cognizant that you could be asymptomatic and still spread it. Because the main point is that the mask is to stop the spread from someone who's infected. The mask is to keep your, dream, your germs, your germs, and not spread them around. And right, right now, that is your duty, regardless right. of what those germs may be. Yeah, a couple, a couple things on that. Uh, one of the arguments that people say is that you know, mat, you know, cloth masks offer a false sense of security. So a lot of people on the public who, and I, it's understandable, to be confused, confused by this. Um, either here, masks don't work, so they don't, they just don't wear them, or they think the cloth mask can work in any situation. And you kind of hit on that. That is not true. Right. Um, but it does offer some security, but not, not total. The other thing I want to say is, um, the reason why people, especially frontline healthcare workers wear gloves and a face shield and all that is because there is something to be said to get out of the habit of like touching your your fingers to your eyes or to your nose and, you know, get, get or to your mouth and that can increase your, your exposure also. The other thing is, is to know the guidelines for what type of mask you're using and to clean them and sanitize them appropriately. So wearing a surgical mask that is meant to be one or maybe two time use for weeks on end, that can be a problem. If you are wearing a mask and you're constantly pulling it down from your nose and wearing it like a chin strap, um, every time you pull it up, you may be contaminating yourself based on what is on your chin or another area part of your body. So you really want to use them appropriately in the situation, um, especially in crowds. And you don't want to like, um, and I, I was guilty of this at the beginning because I walk every day. Every time you walk by somebody, pull the mask up over your nose 
and then pull it down. And then you've come into another crowd of people, you pull it up over your nose and then pull it down. That's not appropriate use. You keep it up, keep it up if you're in crowds and keep it up there the whole time. Um, one very important thing I wanna say, and I think this is very interesting here, that we don't hear a lot about, and this may be some, the reason why we see uh, spikes in other parts of the world um, and where other countries have done really well with uh, at least mask wearing or where they kept the uh, infectivity rates really, really low. Um, one of the things that we find in medicine is with any medicine or any exposure, we have to really be aware of dosage of that exposure. So one of the things that masks do is they decrease your dosage of, ex dosage of exposure. So masks may not prevent you from being inflicted or have the virus land in your mouth or in your nostrils, okay? But what it will do, we know for sure, is decrease the dosage of that happening. So instead of 100 droplets landing on your fingers and, um, or in your nose or anything like that, you may get one droplet. One droplet may be enough for your immune system to handle where you don't have any issues and you become asymptomatic. So you will get less sick because the dose is not as much. The virus you get in your body, the more virus you get in your body, the more sick you're likely to get. And we're starting to see that with, um, with research. So, you know, most face masks are, are, are effective in preventing you from launching droplets into air than, than breathing already dispersed droplets. So basically, you know, dosage plays a role. Um, and it also means that the protection is offered both ways, right. you know, not only to the wearer, but to the, to the, to the other person also. Yeah. This is where um, it gets super obviously common sense where if you right. put any sort of barrier, a barrier is helping in some sort of way. Right. So and yeah. then we, we, we talk about, um, you know, uh, herd, herd immunity, herd immunity is basically like where there's a critical point where enough people have the virus and create antibodies that it no longer spreads in the population. That's basics of, of herd immunity. But one of the best ways, one of the best ways to, to, uh, get the virus really, it's, it's kind of like a vaccination almost is to have very low dosage of exposure where you have no symptoms at all. Um, and that you can create antibodies and stop the virus and you're aiding in that. So the whole argument that not wearing masks, not wearing masks can help with herd, herd immunity, which we're a long way away from that. Um, basically what you're doing is you're talking about a whole bunch of people getting sick, possibly like we were talking about before, 1.5 million people in the US dying from this. Whereas if you wear a mask, you may be exposed to the virus, and you don't get any symptoms and you're not exposing anybody else and you may be contributing to that onward movement towards herd immunity by wearing a mask. So that argument can be used against you, you know? So wearing a mask uh, limits your exposure, limits the dosage. That may be a very, very uh, good thing for us to do. It may help with us as far as the herd immunity goes and will keep people from getting sick or dying. So that's a very, that's a very interesting thing. So I wanna go over some some uh, studies here, let's see. Um, uh, okay, reading this from an article I pulled. In February, one of the first outbreaks, and this is coming from um, a doctor named Monica Gandhi. I think she's an epidemiologist. Um, let's see, oh, fi in, yes, infectious disease specialist at UC San Francisco anyway. In February, one of the first outbreaks of COVID-19 outside of China occurred in, on the Diamond Princess cruise ship. So cruise ships may be a good uh, way to, to get an idea of how this virus operates. It yeah, if you're going on a cruise now, just jump off. Just, <laughs> just stay in the water. Just. Well, well, but here, here, here's the thing. It's very interesting. So anyway, th this, this occurred outside of China. It's the Diamond Princess cruise ship docked in Yokohama, Japan. Of the 634 people on board who tested positive, about 18% of the infections were asymptomatic, okay? In March, an Argentinian cruise ship found itself in a similar situation, but of the 128 people on board who eventually tested positive, 81% were asymptomatic. All right, so, that, so we're talking about 18% 
versus 81% being asymptomatic. And the reason why is they all, we all had exposure, they all tested positive, but they're thinking the reason why is, is because they practiced those methods of, you know, washing your hands, wearing a mask. Um, I think on this particular ship, surgical masks were issued to all passengers and N95s to all staff. So even though people tested positive, most of them were asymptomatic. You really, if you're going to get this thing, you want to be asymptomatic. Sure. Yeah. Um, and what you're hitting at there, Keone, is kind of the load. Is that correct? The load. Yeah. The, load. the dose. Mm -hmm. um, another another uh, kind of... Uh, study. Uh, this is an Oregon seafood processing plant where workers were required to wear face masks, reported an outbreak of 124 cases, 95% of which were asymptomatic. Again, they were wearing masks, even though they, they got it, but they were asymptomatic. That's great. And then here in uh, the southeast in Arkansas, um, Tyson chicken plant, workers were provided mandatory masks, 455 out of 481, or nearly 95% were asymptomatic. That speaks to the dosage that you're being exposed to. Yeah. So that's, that's huge. Yeah, it's important to know. Yeah, so, and, okay, one of the kind of last things I want to I wanna go over, because um, this is definitely related. We're talking about, you, you've heard it in the media, right? The hydroxychloroquine and mm -hmm. how people should, you know, I've heard it people on this say, podcast. <laughs> okay. <laughs> how people, how people should be taking that. It's a great, it's a great treatment. Um, a number of things I want to say that it, it kind of hits on the whole mask wearing studies. Uh, there are again, no gold standard studies on hydroxychloroquine, none. So there are no not, you know, randomized placebo controlled studies on it. And the ones that do, and the ones that we do have, just like with a mask, um, basically show that it, it doesn't work. A lot of the studies were used in combination with corticosteroids. So we know corticosteroids help because you're getting a body full of inflammation when you get attacked by this virus. So using anything to quell that uh, brings it down. So we don't really have good studies on it. And plus uh, hydroxychloroquine, um, you really need to, before even taking that, you need to talk to your doctor about it anyway, because it can cause some devastating um, side effects if, if you're not using, using it appropriately. But for right now, the, the jury uh, really is, the, the, the scales are tipped towards hydroxychloroquine does not work. Okay, so again, show, show us some gold standard, double blind, placebo controlled studies, and uh, maybe, uh, Dr. Fauci uh, will be promoting hydroxychloroquine. But right now, it just is not one of those things to uh, jump on the bandwagon with. Um, the other thing I will say that I do think will help, and this speaks to our bias, Brian, we talked about this a lot, is um, using those barrier methods, using those sanitation methods we talked about, but also, it's not talked about a lot in the media, is making sure that you're doing what you can to keep your own immune system up. Mm -hmm. And that includes things like we have some pretty good evidence. Again, we don't have double blind placebo controlled studies, but again, this, these things are not going to hurt you. Make sure your vitamin D levels are up. Okay. Make sure you're taking a little bit of zinc. We, we do know that zinc seems to help. There are some studies that show vitamin C does seem to help. It's certainly not going to hurt you. So on our podcast, we tend to promote things, especially from the natural perspective that, you know, may not have all the evidence that we need to show, but we also know that it's not going to hurt you. And with other viruses and other studies out there, the, the, those things that we just mentioned helped. Um, and then last but not least, and this is a good segue, I think our next podcast coming up is we're going to hit on sleep, but one of the best things you can do for your immune system, the best at, out of everything, is getting enough sleep and making sure you're well rested. Um, I think it's a tragedy that a lot of healthcare workers are overworked and working, you know, two, three nights on end, especially residents in the hospital. Um, they're decreasing their immune system. They may be carriers of this and um, not getting enough sleep can be uh, be very dangerous for people. Not to mention that if you're not getting enough sleep, it's worse than drunk driving if you're getting on the road. So we'll talk about that um, next time. Is there anything else we should go over, Brian? Do you think we hit on most of everything? Yeah, that was, that was pretty much everything. Wear the mask. 
Yeah, wear the mask. I hate it. I think it's a real inconvenient thing to do, but um, wear, wear the mask. And if you just absolutely cannot wear that mask for whatever reason may be, then try to stay home as much as you can stay out of crowds. I mean, if 90 to 90% of the population did these things and social distance were, um, we would have this thing um, under, under control. Have you been tested for it, Keanu? Um, I have not been tested for it yet, but you can get tested. It's much easier to get tested for, for it now. Um, you can go almost anywhere. I think if you give, give blood now, they'll test your antibodies for free. Mm. So, awesome. You know, but no, I haven't, I haven't had tested. And luckily, I haven't had, um, we haven't had any known cases come through our clinic. Um, that doesn't mean a whole lot or anybody with any types of the, the symptoms that come on. So Good. But, but yes, I, I will be tested at some point and I will be getting my antibodies tested soon here. Awesome. Well, I guess let's mention our salad offer for this month, Keone. Okay. So if you're listening to this episode, you can click on the show notes and there is first link. There is our PDF of the Wellman's podcast, or I'm gonna have to refer to Keone for the full name of the salad. <laughs> The full, yeah, the full name. Let me just see if I can remember what it, it's called. The uh, there's a somersault in there. Yeah, the 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 super rainbow devil somersault backflip salad. It, yeah, the secret is it changes it. every damn time. If you listen to <laughs> yeah, all these right. episodes. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> that's right. But so anyway, you, it's an extraordinary salad. It an is. immune boosting salad, a phytonutrient boosting salad, a fiber boosting salad, a salad of health. A longevity salad. So and it'll yes. stay for a week with kind of the way we break down or Keone breaks down how to prepare the salad and keep it um, stored for a week. Yeah. So if you want all that information as well as the full recipe right there without having to listen to that episode where we covered it, click that link in the show notes. It'll take you to a questionnaire where we just ask some basic questions about how we can make the podcast better and better serve you. And then you'll open up a new tab and that PDF will be right there as well as you'll get emailed a copy of that PDF and uh, let us know how we can better serve you guys. We'd love to create some episodes that are specifically tailored to some of the things that you're encountering or having difficulties with right now as it relates to your health. Anything else there, Keone? Nope. Um, hopefully we'll get through this. Um, just yeah. follow the basic, basic guidelines of stay at home if and when you can, stay out of crowds, wear a mask in crowds, wash your hands, social distance, um, uh, be safe. Yeah, absolutely. Be safe, everyone. We'll talk with you next week. Take care. Bye.